Uh, good morning to all of you um, in person and virtually. My name is Chris Albashir. Um, very excited to be here with you for this awesome weekend full of pots. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Northern Clay Center and the American Pottery Festival um, for having me this year. It's an honor. It's been a ton of fun so far. Uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of pots from 2014 through present day. Um, this will cover my time in Minnesota as an undergrad uh, for my BFA show and student teaching through graduate school, um, some residency opportunities, and into my full-time studio practice that I have now. This was a pretty common scene um, during my time at MSU Moorhead in Moorhead, Minnesota. Um, I was addicted to the salt kiln for my junior and senior years, uh, but if I wanted to fire, I had to fill the entire kiln. I was the only one in my class that was interested in doing any atmospheric firing. Um, so if I wanted to do it, I had to fill it to make it happen. Um, looking back at this now, it's crazy to see that much work and I had no plan. It had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Just about making the work. Uh, these next couple slides are work from my BFA show in the spring of 2015. So these uh, are some images from my BFA show in the spring of 2015. Um, that entire show was salt fired, uh, focus on utility, quantity. Um, I was making my own clay and glazes, which I was super interested in. Um, all of these pieces were part of larger sets, cups, mugs, tumblers, whiskey sets, uh, rows of bottles. Um, I was using a lot of wax resist, trying to work with you know the bare clay, work in some negative space. Some tea sets from my BFA show, um, these were I like a really rich dark red stoneware. Um, I was in the middle of my student teaching. Currently, when these photos were taken, I graduated that semester with both my art education and ceramics degrees. Um, then I left school with a plan to teach for three years, and then I wanted to go to graduate school. Uh, this picture was taken that same spring of 2015 on my last day with this AP clay and sculpture class. Um, Nancy Lear, she's in the like red and white plaid, amazing inspiration, um, an educator. So learned a lot from her, really wanted to teach because of her. Uh, the next fall, I was subbing for her for a couple days. Some health complications arose. I ended up teaching her class for the next eight months. Um, so that was my first year of teaching high school. Um, I was at a big public high school in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, that job ended. Uh, that year after her retirement and I ended up teaching just a few blocks up the street at a private Catholic school for the next two years. Uh, that same time, this is back at MSU Moorhead, uh, I really wanted to learn how to build kilns and they didn't have a soda kiln. Um, so they let me spend a few semesters learning how to build and plumb and fire a soda kiln. Um, the other one is at my parents' house. Uh, right when I graduated, I got a bunch of pallets of kiln brick from a local potter tearing down his studio. So I built a, a wood salt kiln in my parents' backyard just outside of Bismarck that I still get to fire once every couple of years when I'm back in town. These are some of the early pieces that I got out of the soda kiln. Um, lots of texture, mostly applied with slip and rubber ribs. Uh, silicone basting brushes were my friend back then as well. Um, I continued the, the glaze and the clay body testing, not really with any skill or idea, just a little bit of this to see what happens. Beginning in late summer of 2017, I was pretty sure that I wanted to apply to graduate school. My plan all along had been to teach for three years, and this was year three. I worked on my portfolio nights and weekends while I was teaching full time. I made and remade and remade that portfolio three or four times. And then finally, after about six months, I was confident that I had a portfolio that was cohesive, diverse, unique, and skillfully made. And then I got into graduate school. Um, this was a celebratory train wood kiln firing um, during my last independent study semester. I was accepted into the program at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in upstate New York and was eager to dive into their brand new outdoor, at outdoor atmospheric kiln facilities. Um, I was soda firing at least once a week and working on new forms and material testing. They had substantially more materials and equipment than I had ever seen. Um, really exciting time. I learned new perspectives from the faculty during critiques. Um, it sort of cut off, but the image with the, the pots on the pedestal um, sort of show them taking the gallery apart, restacking pots, creating new forms, working with shadows. Um, super helpful new perspective that I still use today. Um, working on new combinations of color and forms. 
Um, I quickly learned that I had got into graduate school with some preconceived ideas about brown soda and wood fire pots mm -hmm. and my own definition of growth and research. Um, I was being steered in new directions from six different faculty and really struggling to find my own voice in the work, but I knew that I wasn't ready to bail on the atmospheric pots yet. Um, I fought hard against the use of mason stains when I was in undergrad, um, but all of a sudden I had access to every brand, every color at cost. Um, so it was something that became super accessible for me. So these are some um, soda fired pieces that I managed to keep some stains in without burning out. Uh, I did burn out a lot of money in stains uh, in the salt and the soda kiln. Um, so my second semester of school, I started making some earthenware work in the electric kilns just to eliminate the risk of burning out the stains. Um, I was working at Cone 3. It was hot enough to have like really durable watertight clays, um, but not hot enough to risk burning anything out. Um, got to do a lot of testing. The brown clay body that's under these red pots took me like 63 test batches um, to find the clay that was the clay. Um, and then of course, a year later, the clay started shivering and fell apart. Oh. And welcome to ceramics. <laughs> Uh, that same semester, I had figured out some glaze bases that would hold on to the color um, in soda and wood kilns. So I finally stopped sticking pots to kilns and burning out color. Um, this was a series of work that I was using basting brushes and paint rollers to glaze, trying to find something that was maybe a little more uh, unpredictable and carefree. I continued with the earthenware line of pots. Um, I'd also gotten into 3D printing and mold making um, that same semester. So of course I defaulted to citrus reamers for my juicer research. Um, cocktails are the best. Mm -hmm. So that was that was an easy decision. Um, there was a lot of kilns at Alfred of all kinds. So like that juicer um, is cone eleven reduction, given that porcelain like a, a really nice icy blue translucency. Uh, my midterm critique that semester I titled that juicer edition. Um, it was only a discussion on juicer forms and ideas and functionalities. Um, the piece on the right was my attempt at tie-dyeing a form. Um, it had a juicer attachment that would go under the lid. On its own, it was a teapot. Uh, but if you wanted to you know, get some fresh citrus in that tea, you just had an attachment for it. Sort of a frivolous cupboard space user. Um, and then that pedestal is covered in a macro image of the surface, just working on maybe some different display options, how to incorporate the work into its surroundings a little bit. I returned primarily to low-fire work uh, soon after the juicers that semester. Um, I was working with Linda Sakura that time as my advisor. She helped and influenced my work in ways that I'm still figuring out to this day in my studio. Um, the way that I think about color, form, uh, parts of a pot, the process of making, getting content into the work and into the forms, um, sort of finding my voice in the work, what makes a pot a crisp pot. Um, previously, it had been about, you know, quantity and production, um, and I wanted it to be less about the technical aspects of the clay and the quantity and more about the work. And that took me until my third semester of school to get to that point. Um, Linda helped me see what made my work interesting and unique on its own, aspects that I was doing unknowingly um, and needed to focus on. Uh, really commit to something, pay attention to what I was paying attention to in the studio. I was on a flight back from my parents' house um, over Christmas break and was like, why don't I just put the color in the clay? Mm -hmm. And it can't move, it can't go anywhere. Um, so this was the first round of pots I ever got out of an electric kiln um, of the colored porcelain work that I'm still making today. So this was um, January of 2020, right before the pandemic come a long way in the last three years. By working with that colored clay, uh, I could eliminate all glazing problems. Uh, historically, I did not have great skill with glazing, hence slapping things with paint rollers and basting brushes, <laughs> um, trying to make the problems go away. Um, but that lack of skill was no longer an issue. The color just stayed where you put it, sort of like building with Play-Doh. Um, I continued the earthenware work into my final semester. That clay was way more forgiving um, for assembling some larger forms, maybe some more advanced forms. Uh, my porcelain was shrinking about 20%, which opened it up to a lot of seam issues, cracking issues. This was part of a series that I called Countertop Jar Arrangements. 
Um, there's a focus on working asymmetrically with silhouette, negative space, and diversity in use um, in mind for these pieces. This one is shown with its multiple lid flanges that fit on both pieces to allow for the user to use it as they see fit. And then the pandemic happened. Um, so this was March of 2020. We were given a few days heads up to prep our studios to be gone for what they said was up to two weeks. Um, I was skeptical. I spent all day and all night that week making molds, making clay, making new buckets of glaze. I took my wheel, I took my wear carts home at a concrete basement in the house I was living in. So I got to have a little pandemic studio to keep working on some thesis work and some, some thoughts I was in the middle of. Um, turned out to be the right decision that two weeks turned into a month and then two months and then I never got to go back into the studio again until they gave us eight hours to empty it and clean it and vacate the property. Um, so this is how I abandoned my studio in March, uh, packed with pieces in all stages of progress. Um, that other image, uh, I was working with John Gill also that semester and he showed me how to make these cool paper cutout silhouettes as like a volume study, form studies. Um, so those were some some jar studies I was in the middle of. Before we look at the rest of the new body of work that I'm making, um, I wanted to show you a few slides of some inspiration, trying to give it a little more context and give you a better sense of where these ideas, the colors and the forms are coming from. Uh, here we have some modern and historical glass forms found in muse museum collections. Um, the water pitcher on the left was found at the Corning Museum of Glass um, in upstate and it's got a beautifully curved base, uplifting it off the table with a bold shadow. Um, the cups that accompany it have like very heavy, solid bases, bringing up questions like, how heavy is too heavy? And questions of use and balance in the work. The other two pieces are from the Met in New York City. Um, those have inspired texture, volume, proportion, symmetry, and balance in my new work. I worked with a painting professor for one of my semesters as well, trying to nail down some specific colors. And I was introduced to so many amazing painters um, that had color at the forefront of their work. Um, Sol Lewitt is on uh, the left and Atel Adnan on the right. Looking at paintings and working with the painter made it very apparent that mixing my own colors was going to be an important part of the success and the content of my new work. Um, color straight out of the tube was available to anybody, so I needed to individualize and really be intentional with the colors that I was making. Uh, I love the atmosphere of casinos and arcades, um, the noise, the color, the flashing, the overstimulation of all of your senses. Um, aspects that I still think a lot about today when I'm in the studio, how to make a color just a little more punchy, what can grab a viewer's attention, things like that. Uh, thrift stores and antique stores, some of my favorite places to visit, um, forms, pop culture, durability of material, all aspects that have changed with modern manufacturing. So, uh, you know, all these forms are quirky, colorful, full of potential in many ways. I have an ever-growing collection of 70s wooden play school toys that are always accessible in my studio for inspiration. My new studio has a wood floor, so imagine somebody like rolling wheelie ducks around all day. Um, but it's you got to have fun if you're having fun. Yeah. Back to some pots now. Um, during the pandemic, I had that small basement studio uh, that was set up during lockdown that allowed me to keep working. Um, I was the only one making pots in my grad class. Everybody else was making pretty large scale sculpture. So I took it as a, a privilege that I was able to keep working during that time. Um, the best thing that came from working from home was the lack of pressure to please my faculty. Yes, I was still going to have to defend this work, um, but I had free reign to trash pots, take more risks um, without anybody else ever knowing about it. These jars are small, uh, most under three, three and a half inches, um, and opened up use in so many peculiar ways. Um, you could use them to store a single Twizzler, um, <laughs> your pocket full of jelly beans, or uh, I had a faculty member take one and she stored her found cat whisker collection in one of these. The forms got more refined. Uh, there were more color combinations, larger scales were possible since I was literally stuck at home watching clay dry um, and could manage the moisture content like I never had before. I began making forms for oddly specific purposes, 
uh, such as this utensil holder for your next shellfish dinner party. Little tugboat that takes your crab forks out and about. <laughs> I started making these little keychain juicers uh, for your on-the-go margarita needs, uh, sort of for comedic reasons, but also it was key lime season and I needed a mini juicer. Working with the multiple components in a form or in a set uh, allowed me to try many options to find what was going to work best. So this mortar and pestle um, that has finely ground crushed brick wedged into the porcelain, kind of making it look like a stone. Um, I used to make those in large batches, like six to 10. I could curate the mortars and the pestles sort of after the facts, see what was going to work best. Um, learn a lot about color combinations for the future, some form combinations for the future as well. As my thesis defense grew near, still with no access to university facilities to make displays or photograph any work, um, I decided to make my thesis exhibition on a miniature scale. Uh, this is a 30 by 30 inch foam pour gallery that I installed all of my shrinky dink pots in. Uh, so if you're not familiar with shrinky dinks, uh, plastic you can draw on, cut out, put it in the oven. It shrinks, gets thick, becomes like cool little toys. Um, so all of these pots did exist. Uh, they were all finished pieces that were meant to go in a real gallery. Uh, you can see all the actual pots in the image on the right. Um, all of the shelves were made of paper pedestals for little two by four scraps from the dumpster. Um, the work was all colored pencil shrinky dinks hung up with sticky tack. Um, the little avatars on the floor in the gallery are representative of the six faculty and myself mm -hmm. that would have been um, in the gallery for my defense. Um, so I'm the cool checkerboards mustard van. Mm -hmm. John Gill's got his wild sweater present. I had to make light of a hard time. And then I graduated. Um, so the next chunk of slides we're going to look at um, is sort of how much has happened since since grad school, since 2020, um, through residency and into my current self-employment as a full-time artist. Uh, last fall, I completed a two-year residency at the Clay Studio of Missoula. Uh, I taught community ed classes, I worked in the sales gallery, and I had a full-time studio practice there. Um, my time there allowed me to work with more colors of clay than I had ever imagined. I had seven colors of porcelain that I was working with in school. Um, now I routinely have 20 to 30 colors made at any given time with a total of about 50 or 55 um, that find their way into the work total. The time to slow down and be more intentional with each piece has been very exciting. Um, I'm now making work out of porcelain that was only made out of the forgiving earthenware previously. Um, the piece on the right, a form I call Ewers on Rails. Mm -hmm. um, it has thrown slab and press molded parts, sort of all assembled into a little utilitarian sculpture. Uh, I have a pretty high loss rate with both drying and firing due to the finicky nature of my porcelain. Um, this work's shrinking about 21% at Cone 10 right now, um, and my cast work is shrinking about 24%. Um, so lots of opportunities for cracks and warping. Um, lids specifically had their own learning curve, but I've slowly gotten a grasp on um, some new drying and firing techniques to keep those round and intact. June of last year, I had a solo show for the conclusion of my residency at the Clay Studio that was titled Swell. Um, the vase on the left is an example of what I've been doing more recently uh, with 3D printed and slip cast parts. Um, so I think that little vase, that's a, a ray gun vase, little toy gun, um, you know, it's quick and easy to stick 13 parts together just to make these cool little sculptural forms. I continue to push myself in new directions with new colors, forms, combinations. The work finally feels like it's my own. Um, one of the best decisions I ever made for my work was to stop looking at contemporary pots. Um, I only looked at historical works, 100 plus year old pieces in order to force myself to not be inspired by the new creations in the field of contemporary ceramics. These images are from my solo show uh, called Teeter Totter that was at Inseca in Cincinnati earlier this year. This is a few variations on some slip cast sorbet and cocktail cups, sort of a how many forms you can make with one mold situation going on. And then a blue toucan mm -hmm. because he belonged there.
Looking outside of contemporary ceramics also got me looking for inspiration in all of those other places that we looked at earlier, um, culminating in these playful, colorful ceramic toys, I call them. Um, durable, inviting, things ready for daily use. Here we've got a wide variety of things going on. Uh, there's some toast rack caterpillars. Um, there's a pistachio swing. Uh, a produce display piece, sort of like the tubes from Mario, um, a sippy cup ice bucket, and some candy dishes on the pedestals in the background. And most recently, uh, myself and a friend renovated a radiology office turned call center in Missoula, Montana. Um, we got the lease in January and had our grand opening May 5th of this year. Um, we currently have 16 artists in-house, uh, painters, printmakers, potters, slip casters, sculptures um, in both private and communal space. Um, so, you know, I needed a studio after my residency and we wanted to make it happen. Um, so Workroom Montana opened this summer. Um, we both have backgrounds in education and have made it a priority to provide high quality opportunities to our local community. Um, I received a grant this spring for materials to host free art making experiences for the community on our monthly First Friday Art Walks. Um, it's also supplied all of the materials for painting, printmaking, tie-dye, paper making, and professional practices programming that we have already launched so far this summer. Thank you for coming to my talk. I gotta ask, have yeah. you ever worked as a bartender? Absolutely. Okay, I figured. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep a fully stocked bar. Love it. At home. We'll talk cocktails. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is your favorite cocktail? Sorry. My favorite cocktail? Yeah. Um, I think the Gimlet is probably the most versatile. Um, currently in Montana, it's huckleberry season. Um, so I've been making some like huckleberry basil cocktail syrups, like a huckleberry basil margarita. Mm, yum. Um, but I think a Gimlet is probably the most accessible your face says no 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 that was a that was a thoughtful like mm -hmm. i don't think i've had anyone say the word gin that's made in a long time oh yeah <laughs> since i was bartender so i was just a, yeah oh, cool. use, yeah. use good gin yeah. yeah yeah i have a question about your porcelain body did absolutely you, did, did you formulate it yourself with your own recipe uh i just want to know what the, the high shrinkage rate is so my porcelain body is the clay body that nick waddell is actually using i don't know if you've seen any of his new sort of porcelain gloopy um, work, but he was a year ahead of me in school and I knew that it took color well. Um, it's a very, very white, uh, super standard porcelain New Zealand Kaolin body. Um, does require a lot of vegan yes. to you know not be blue cheese crumbles. Mm -hmm. um, but currently I can roll it into a coil. I can tie it in knots. You can braid this clay. Is it, is it cone 10 or cone 11? Yep, these are all cone 10. And you can get that beautiful color in such a high temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a few pinks and yellows. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to share. I've lost a lot of stains. A lot of stuff will go gray. Um, pinks will just disappear. Um, but I've had really good luck recently. I've been making the switch to US Pigments brand stains mm -hmm. instead of Mason brand stains. Um, some of Masons are still cheaper for like purples and blues, um, but US Pigments are 29 a pound across the board which is half the price of some of Mason's warm colors right now. And you just wipe the stains in the porcelain that you have? I make everything as slip. Okay. So everything starts as the same bright white porcelain slip. Um, then I blunge all the colors in. About half my studio is taken up with large plaster slabs currently. Um, so I always have slip poured out drying until it's wedgeable. But uh, with the shrinkage, that you, is that typical for porcelain or for the student to your clay body? Um, I feel like I'm cursed by my clay body. <laughs> yeah, like a normal growling porcelain that you can buy commercially, like might have crazy shrinkage of 15, 16 percent. Um, so, yeah, mine is exceptionally shrinky. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. But it's really nice since everything is the same base. Everything sticks together, shrinks together. Is that what inspired your Shrinky Dink uh, gallery? <laughs> no, I actually used to have a Shrinky Dink unit when I was a high school teacher. Um, yeah, we had a tie-dye unit and a Shrinky Dink unit. Um, so I've just been into Shrinky Dinks for years and I wanted to be able to fire something. Um, so I got to cook the Shrinky Dinks in my oven. 
to fire them for my show. Okay. Yeah, it was punny. Yeah. 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 What's up, Lydia? Um, I want to know about how you store your play and, and like to have so many different kinds of yeah. play. Like, and then also how many pounds of each like clay colors you have to time. Yeah. So uh, I just have a big like Costco wire baker's rack on wheels um, that I separate everything warm colors and cool colors. Um, there's some pieces like this blue dog that's on the screen has all these chunks in it. Um, so I try to separate that's work that has colored grog that I make um, wedged into it and that can't go into my reclaim process. Um, so that's all on its own shelf. Um, but when it's ready to wedge up, um, I usually end up with about 17 pounds of each color and make them as a 5,000 gram batch because that's what fits in a two gallon bucket. Um, Blunge it, sip it, dry it out for a few days, and then I just bag them up in reused clay bags that I wash out. And then when you're throwing, what do you do with sludge? Do you ever like combine different colors? Yeah. Um, in all transparency, I don't know how to make about half of the colors that you'll see in my work um, because they're reclaim colors. Mm -hmm. So I have a four bucket reclaim mm -hmm. system. So I try to throw and trim in similar colors. So like I'll change, you know, I'll empty my splash pans after all of the pinks, reds, and oranges. And that all goes in one bucket. Um, and then I'll do greens, blues, and yellows. And those all go in one bucket. And then anything that can go purple goes in its own bucket. And then inevitably I forget. And then I have a bucket that's going to be kind of a gross gray brown color. And then I dump enough best black mason stain into that. And then that's my black portion. <laughs> Um, so I tried, I mean, my clay is really expensive, so anything I can do to yeah. recycle. So I have very, very low waste rate. And your scale is generally kind of maybe the smaller? Yeah, the biggest piece I've ever made out of this clay um, was an outdoor sculpture for a show at the Cincinnati Zoo um, for Inseca, and it was 17 inches tall. Um, and it happened to be three parts that I had to throw separately and stack on top of each other. Um, this clay is super, super forgiving, but it does like to just sit down under its own weight if it gets too big. Um, so I'm limited if I want to, you know, make like a cookie jar that might be 16 to 18 inches tall. It's made in four parts of rings just to get things that tall. Um, so the individual pieces tend to be, you know, under six to seven inches. You know, I might throw a popcorn bowl and now it's a soup bowl. Do you ever fold finish like connecting pots, like with the epoxy or anything like that? I've tried like colored PC11 yeah. or bray epoxy takes stains really well. It does. Yeah. I tried to keep more of like a, a tight, mysterious attachment finish than like letting people know, look, I've squished orange epoxy. I know it's a lot of it's microwave safe, dishwasher safe, food safe, but I've tried to make it a point to, you know, maybe use some glaze to hide a seam line or something as a nice pop of color. Um, but I haven't done a whole lot of epoxy finishing yet. Do you think your like scale limitations like hinder your creative process at all? Or have you just kind of like acclimated to working with it? Uh, I kind of love it. Um, I used to, you know, when I was doing atmosphere firing stuff, it was, you know, groggy stone wares, things that you could work, huge platters, super forgiving. Um, and it was really hard on my body. And now I get to work with like very, very soft cream cheese um so like and so i don't know i think i've become really appreciative of the smaller scale i've had a lot less shoulder problems a lot less visits to the chiropractor i had to do acupuncture for a while to like fix some shoulder and elbow pain and now i love the detail you know like these little wiener dogs um you can cram a lot into three inches and that's sort of become um i was never detail oriented until i started this work so that's been a really pleasant change i wasn't expecting